Hey, in this video, I wanted to go over a form of viral replication known as the lytic life cycle. So let's jump right in and think about um, this lytic life cycle and how it compares to other ways that bacteria can reproduce. So really there are two major ways that virals, viral particle, particles can replicate. There's this lytic life cycle that we'll talk about in this video, and then a lysogenic life cycle, which we will talk about separately. Um, we can see here in this diagram that these two life cycles are related, that they overlap. Um, one cannot ex or the lysogenic life cycle cannot exist without the ly lytic life cycle. And so we'll dive into that more later. But again, in this video, let's really focus on the lytic life cycle. So. Uh, if we focus on just the top part of that diagram, we're going to think about this lytic life cycle. So this diagram sort of runs clockwise here, and we're going to think about the different steps. But for the lytic life cycle, there are a couple main details I really want you to take away from this. And the first is that this lytic life cycle is pretty fast. Uh, for the bacterial viruses we are talking about, um, this life cycle can take about 30 minutes. So it's a quick process. Uh, it's important to recognize that this lytic life cycle produces many viral particles. So we're going to walk through this diagram. We see here one virus is going into the cell and reproducing, and then many viruses are coming out. Um, so this isn't like cell replication where one cell makes two cells. In viral replication, one virus can make many, many viruses during replication. And um, for the bacterial viruses we're going to talk about, oftentimes the number of viruses produced is in the hundreds. All right, so this process is really fast. This process produces a whole bunch of viral particles. And then I think perhaps the most important detail to never lose track of is when this happens, when, the, when a virus performs lytic replication in a host cell, that host cell dies. And we can see that in this last diagram here. The cell is popping open and these viruses are leaving. Viral replication kills cells. And that's a really important factor not to lose track of. Okay, so let's think about the steps of this little lytic viral replication cycle. All right, we're gonna break this replication cycle into five major steps. We're gonna call them attachment, uh, the next one I will always refer to as entry, but you might see in books it referred to as penetration. The next step I refer to as synthesis, but again in some books and some sources you'll see biosynthesis. After that we'll go through assembly. Again, some other resources might call it maturation. And then finally we'll talk about release, or in some cases people will just refer to this as lysis. So, these steps happen every single time, and they always happen in this exact order. So if we want to master our understanding of the lytic replication cycle, we need to understand each of these steps and be able to put them in the correct order. So let's go one by one. We'll start with step one, attachment. Think about what happens during that step and what it looks like. So during attachment, the first thing that happens is that the viral particle basically just bumps into a potential host cell. One of the things we need to remember about viruses is that they're not very complex. They don't have flagella, so they can't swim. They don't have cilia like some protist cells, again, so they can't swim. They don't have fins like a fish, they can't swim. They don't have legs or arms like animals, so they can't uh, walk or run. They don't have wings, they cannot fly. Uh, viral particles cannot move on their own. Uh, in the environment, they basically just end up where the environment takes them. If they're in a stream, they're going to flow downstream. If they're in water, they'll diffuse around like any other particle. And then every once in a while, a virus will get lucky, and in its environment, it's just going to randomly bump into a cell. Okay? If that cell is a appropriate host for that virus, that host cell will have these surface markers, proteins, carbohydrates, anything on the first surface of the cell that indicate it's, it's the correct match for this virus. When the virus and the host cell are a match, and only when they're a match, 
will the virus stick to the cell. So what causes the virus to stick? We will always talk about these spike proteins. So spike proteins are special proteins on the outside of a virus that will allow it to stick to its host cell. So let's look at a picture. What does this look like? So here's an image demonstrating a complex bacterial virus. Uh, so at the top here, it's got a capsid with its genetic material inside. It's got a base and then these tail fibers. These are the things that I would refer to as the spikes. These tail fibers are making contact with the cell surface and they're looking for a match. I often refer to spike proteins as being like a key and the surface receptors or markers on the host cell are like a lock. And only if that lock and key match will this viral particle stick to this host cell. So again, these spike proteins are sticking to markers on the outside of the host, spikes to markers like a lock and a key. And that's attachment, is just when a virus sticks to an appropriate host cell. Once it, the virus is stuck, we'll move on to step two. Um, before we go on, I should show you this better picture. So here is an electron micrograph of a bacterial cell. And that bacterial cell is attached to many, many viral particles. But we can see these balls are the viral particle heads. And then coming off of them, you can see those tail fibers. And the tail fibers are sticking to the surface of this host cell. So all these viruses are trying to get into this host cell. So again, that's attachment. Next is entry. During entry, the virus is gonna inject its genome, its DNA or RNA into the host cell. And I think in this picture, we can actually see that that has happened for one of these viruses. Here's a viral particle where the head appears to be empty. And I think the image is a little bit darker because there's no more genetic material in here. That genetic material has entered inside the cell. And that's what happens during entry. So here's another picture to represent that. We had attachment where our virus stuck to the cell. And then during entry, the genetic material that is inside this capsid gets injected into the host cell's cytoplasm. And that's entry, right? It's really straightforward. So the first step, the viral, the whole virus sticks to the outside. And the second step, we just want to get the genetic material into the cell. That's entry or penetration, sometimes even called injection. For bacterial viruses, this step often requires the activity of a little bit of lysozyme to weaken the bacterial cell wall so that the DNA can get passed through. We'll talk more about that. All right, so we had attachment, then we had entry. Let's think about the next step. The next step we'll call synthesis. So here we're gonna synthesize things. But prior to starting the synthesis part, one other important thing happens. The first thing that happens is that the virus actually destroys the host genome. So the DNA for the bacterial cell gets destroyed. So here we'll use the diagram from the beginning of the slide. Uh, here we have the viral DNA, the red squiggles, and then we've got this chopped up bacterial DNA. Um, the bacterial DNA has been chopped into a whole bunch of little pieces so that the bacteria cannot utilize it anymore. And when the bacteria tries to make stuff from the directions in the DNA, it will only have the opportunity, opportunity to follow the directions that are in the bacterial genetic information. So after entry, we've got synthesis. The first part of synthesis is we destroy the host cell genome. We chop it into small pieces. Then the virus uses the host cell biosynthetic machinery, things like polymerases and ribosomes, to make more viral components. Specifically, we'll make things like the capsid proteins. We'll make more copies of the viral genome. We'll make a whole bunch of copies of any viral enzymes that the virus needs. So we had attachment, the virus sticks to the outside. Entry, the viral genetic material goes into the cell. Synthesis, the bacterial genetic material is destroyed. Then the viral genetic material is used to make all the viral components. 
So now the cell is going to be filled of all these pieces that are used to make viruses. In the next step, assembly, we're going to take those viral components, those pieces, and we're just going to put them together into new viruses. I think we can see that happening in this electron micrograph of a bacterial cell infected by these bacterial viruses. Inside, we can see a complete capsid with the tail fibers hanging off of it. I think there are more up here, another capsid with tail fibers hanging off of it. Maybe there's another one right there, capsid with tail fibers. Inside this host cell, the virus is, has tricked that cell into making all the viral components, and now the viral components are being put together into complete viral units or viral particles. And that's assembly. Following assembly, we're going to move on to release. So during release, the host cell is going to go through lysis. And these new viral particles that are inside the host cell are going to be released into the environment. So this cell is full of all these viral particles. Once it gets full enough, this cell will pop and all these viruses will be released into the environment. In bacteria, this last step, lysis and the release of the viruses that are inside the bacterial cell, often requires the activity of lysozyme once again. That'll weaken the bacterial cell wall. And we know that a weak bacterial cell wall results in the lysis of that bacterial cell. So five steps of the viral lytic replication cycle. We've got attachment, entry, synthesis, assembly, and release. And I think it's really important that you just be able to give a brief summary and description of what happens during each step. So as always, if you have any questions, I hope you'll reach out uh, via the discussion boards or in class, and we can talk over any details that are giving you trouble. I'll talk to you all again real soon.